John chapter number 3, I want to pick out one of the verses. I bet you know which one it is. So the 16th verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this powerful truth. I pray, Lord, that you would deliver us from the familiarity of it. Probably if I had asked for a show of hands, almost every one in this room this morning would be able to recite this verse. And sometimes that really keeps us from pouring over it and meditating on it, realizing uh, the great truth that should motivate and grip our souls. And so I pray, Lord, as we hear a little bit about how you used it uh, in the life of one of your dear servants, I pray that you would use it also to encourage us and help us even when we do our Bible reading and we get to places like this, that we won't just glide along thinking that we already know it. Help us always to remember that the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so we know, Father, that since the Word of God is living, that you may often use it in new and fresh ways to speak to our hearts. We thank you for that. We pray that we'll always be a a church that's concerned about sharing the love of God, not only with our fellow believers, but also with the lost and dying world around us. We know that's the message, and we pray that you would bless us in that today now. And we'll thank you for all that you do for us now. In Jesus' lovely name, amen. Life-changing verses of the Bible. We continue with that series. And We have taken a little bit of time away now from such a rich place, England, during the 19th century. So many people we were able to look into and see how God's Word dramatically affected their lives. To turn our attention to America and ask, I think, an obvious question, was God doing lots of things in America during that time? And the answer, of course, is yes. So last week, we had the opportunity to talk about Fanny Crosby, America's most well-known hymn writer. And this morning, we are going to talk about America's most well-known evangelist, certainly from that time. His name is D.L. Moody. Before the lifetime of D.L. Moody is done, it is estimated that he will have preached to 100 million people in America and Europe and seen some 750,000, some people say a million, trust Jesus Christ as personal Savior. So since we're talking this morning about an evangelist, how fitting that the verse that the Lord seemed to use so powerfully in his life was John 3.16. That is the verse, and we'll work our way to, to that as we tell a little bit of the story of his life. Dwight Lyman Moody was born on February 5, 1837, into the home, watch this, of a Unitarian bricklayer in Northfield, Massachusetts. His father died before he reached the age of four. And so Moody never attained more than what we would regard today as a fifth grade education. When he was 17, he moved to Boston. He moved to Boston to sell shoes. His uncle there, name of Holton, last name of Holton, agreed to give him a job in his shoe store as long as Moody would make a similar agreement, and that is Moody would agree as a 17-year-old young man who wasn't attending church to come to his uncle's church in Boston, and the name of the church was the Mount Vernon Congregational Church. Congregational Unitarian. In those days, a lot of difference. So it was a new experience for Moody because if you think about this, even you know a little bit about uh, the Unitarian Church, they really don't teach the full deity of Jesus Christ and certainly do not emphasize the need for personal salvation. When Moody got to the Mount Vernon Congregational Church, they did all of those things, so it was a new experience for him. But in spite of the newness of the experience, there was a man there by the name of Edward Kimball. You've heard this story before his Sunday school teacher, who won him to Christ on April 21, 1855. He was 18 years old. I've told the story before, but I'll summarize it just briefly this morning. You know how Moody had agreed to go to the church because I had just told you this. And so he arrives there, and you know how it is when you're in a place that's unfamiliar. Even as a Christian, if you attend or visit another church when you're away on vacation, something of that nature, you're always just a little ill at ease. You don't quite know what the surroundings are. 
And lots of times other people can tell that too. They're just kind of some obvious signs. So Moody goes to the Sunday school class to which he's been directed. It turns out that the teacher is this man, Edward Kimball. So like a lot of Sunday school classes, Kimball gets up to teach the Sunday school class. He's in front of the class. And actually the lesson that morning was from the book of John, the gospel according to John. Well, Moody sees right away, as do the other boys in the class, that he doesn't quite know how to find that place in the Bible. So after he sort of looks at the boys to kind of get them to realize, don't make him feel ill at ease by looking, he walks down from the rostrum and hands his Bible to Moody and takes Moody's Bible back to the rostrum. It's a small act, isn't it? But years later, Moody said he never forgot what Kimball did that day. Well, by and by, Kimball developed a burden. He wanted to find a way to reach Moody for Jesus Christ. And the Lord was burdening him to do this. And so one day he felt led to do this. He set out to have an opportunity to witness to the young Moody. He went to the shoe store. And as he was walking along the street, have you ever had this battle? Seeing as how we were talking about visitation in the Sunday school classes this morning, if you've been on this, you, you're going to have this battle, I'll tell you, and it won't go away. He's on his way. Kimball is on his way to witness to Moody, and all of a sudden he starts thinking to himself, is this really a good idea? Am I going to go to his place of work and run the risk of embarrassing him in front of perhaps other people in the store? Same thing you think about maybe when you're ready to give a track to somebody. Is it, a, is it an opportune time? And he actually, with all of this going on in his mind, he walked past the shoe store. And all at once he realized this, but he overcame that and felt that God was really in it. He turned around and forced himself and got into the shoe store. He found Moody towards the back. And Moody was back there wrapping shoes and placing them on the shelf for customers to see. And he walked up and he put his arm on his shoulder. Later, Kimball said he felt like he gave such a weak witness, but he told him as best he could about the love of God. Well, the time was right. The time was obviously right, and he was able to win Moody to Christ right then and there. Next year, Moody was 19. He moved to Chicago, and he was determined there to make his fortune. In those days, the idea, or the figure, I should say, the figure he had in mind was $100,000, wanted to make that selling shoes. He was a talented salesperson. And so in Chicago, he also started a Sunday school class. You see already how Sunday school had been so instrumental in his own life. He started in the slums of Chicago, a Sunday school ministry. But as time went on, the spiritual ministry that he was involved in, the Sunday school ministry, he found that he enjoyed those opportunities more than the idea of making the $100,000. God was obviously at work in his life. Do you know that by the time he was 23 years old, he had 1,500 people attending that Sunday school class? In fact, that Sunday school class would eventually blossom into the Illinois Street Independent Church. The Illinois Street Independent Church would eventually become the Moody Memorial Church. Not so named during his lifetime, but that's the church it would later become. And by the year 1861, Moody, feeling so impelled by God towards spiritual service, left business entirely. During the Civil War, Moody sort of took mostly the Quaker position. That is to say, he chose conscientiously not to fight. And so he wasn't involved in combat. Interestingly, Ira Sankey was, but not Moody. Moody sort of took, as I say, the Quaker position, but he was very active in the evangelization of Union troops. Over the course of his life, Moody would take a number of trips to England, in fact, seven trips to England. In 1867, on a trip to England, he met, I bet you can guess some people he met, some people who were sort of uh, very much admired and who sort of became heroes. He met Spurgeon. He met George Mueller, but here's the interesting thing. It was actually another individual that he met, someone whose name is not nearly as well known to us as Spurgeon and Mueller, a converted pickpocket turned evangelist by the name of Harry Morehouse. 
He met him while he was on that trip. Well, when it was time to come back to America, Morehouse uh, went along with Moody and sort of, oh, as the saying goes, uh, let Moody know that he wouldn't mind preaching in his church. That's sort of, I guess, inviting yourself. But so it was, Moody wasn't so sure because Moody didn't know that much about his preaching and so he acquiesced. It's kind of interesting, he agreed for this um, on a Thursday night at his church and on a Friday night at his church. It so happened he planned to be out of town those nights. And so he did what all preachers do when they have someone like that when they're planning to be out of town and not there. He asked his wife to sort of let him know how the service went later. So he got home, and when he got home, his wife was all excited and told him, very enthusiastically about Morehouse's preaching and said he preached both nights on John 3.16. Well, so Moody detected his wife's enthusiasm and went to Morehouse and said, hey, how about you preach again tonight? It was Saturday night, so Moody could hear him. And he spoke again. Morehouse spoke again that night on John 3.16. Well, Moody, when he got to the service that night, noticed that there was something just subtly different about the congregation because they were bringing their Bibles to the service, not so much before. And he noticed this, didn't say much, but he noticed it. And as I say, Saturday night, he spoke on John 3.16 again. Moody was impressed enough that he said, why don't you stay and preach tomorrow on Sunday? In fact, he said, why don't you stay and preach on through Thursday of the following week? So on Sunday, Morehouse came to preach. He preached on John 3.16. Monday night, he preached on John 3.16. Tuesday night, he preached on John 3.16. Wednesday night, he preached on John 3.16. He got to Thursday night, and finally he got up before the congregation, and he said, you know, I'm really sorry. He said, I've been looking for another text, but he said, I just can't find anything that's better than the old one. And he preached on John 3.16 again. After the message was over, Morehouse had the opportunity to speak briefly with or privately, I should say, with Moody. And when he did this, these were the words that he uttered to Moody. Mr. Moody, if you will change your course and learn to preach God's words instead of your own, he will make you a great power for good. Well, Moody's ministry as a result of this John 3.16 and the things that Morehouse said to him changed. In fact, some people say or list four ways in which Moody's ministry changed from that point forward. His preaching, number one, became more focused on Scripture. Number two, he used public Bible readings in connection with his message. Number three, he encouraged his audience to bring their Bibles to check up on him. And number four, he preached more on the love of God as revealed in John 3.16. Later, about John 3.16 and all of this, Moody would say this, I used to preach that God was behind the sinner with a double-edged sword ready to hew him down. I never knew that God loved us so much. I took up that word love, and I do not know how many weeks I spent in studying the passages in which it occurs, till at last I could not help loving people. This heart of mine began to thaw out, and I could not hold back the tears. And I want you to listen to this next sentence. If outsiders could find that people in them loved them when they came, the churches would soon be filled. Boy, that's powerful and convicting. And so entered John 3.16 into the life of Moody. It was 1870 when Moody met Ira Sankey. It's very difficult to know anything about Moody without knowing something about Ira Sankey. Ira Sankey became his soloist, his musician. So more on that in just a little while, but just to sort of get the progression, he met him in Indianapolis at a YMCA meeting in 1870, heard him sing. In 1871, you know what happened in Chicago that year? The Great Chicago Fire. And there's so much that you could tell about that that I don't have time now to do it in this message. But there is something else that happened that year that people talk a lot about, and I think probably it should be mentioned in this message. But 
I hope you'll be careful to listen not only to what Moody says about this experience, but a few comments that I'll make as well. So after the fire and Moody, they lost the church. The church burned and I think maybe the YMCA. A number of things were lost. Obviously, vast numbers of homes to people were lost. When Moody felt that he had that under control in so far as his own personal turf was concerned, he accepted an invitation to preach at a church in New York City, took some evangelistic meetings. When he was there, he just sort of felt like the preaching was flat, didn't see much happening. And he also felt like he was not very successful in the fundraising he was hoping to do to get funds together to rebuild the church back in Chicago and other things. So here he is in New York City. He's walking down the street when the Spirit of God just grips him. Here's what Moody has to say about this experience. He says later of it, oh, what a day. I cannot describe it. I seldom refer to it. That's interesting. I seldom refer to it. It is almost too sacred an experience to name. I can only say that God revealed himself unto me, and I had such an experience of his love. Then we're kind of back to the John 3.16 thing again. I had such an experience of his love that I had to ask him to stay his hand. Well, there are lots and lots of people who try to use this experience with the Holy Spirit to kind of promote their take on things. But it's very interesting. See, Moody would never tolerate uh, knowingly. He would not allow tongue speaking in his meetings. So Moody was really never of the what we tend to think about as the charismatic persuasion Uh, What I'm going to tell you about this is I think what Moody says is exactly what we need to heed. He calls it almost too private, almost too sacred an experience really to talk about. And when he did talk about it, it was seldom and little. In the light of Moody's reticence to speak of it and his own subsequent unwillingness to allow tongue speaking and other charismatic excesses in his meetings... I think it's probably best to leave this experience just as Moody did. We can acknowledge it. We can certainly understand that God worked in his heart, but we do not promote necessarily or glamorize it as something that must fit everyone else. It was private. It was something that God did for Moody. But one thing is sure, after that experience, he went back to the church and his preaching was different. The interesting thing about his preaching was that it was the same sermons. He didn't change the sermons so much as it was a little bit different moody. A hundred people were saved in those meetings. It's 1871 this happened. In the years 1873 to 1875, Moody was involved in what is probably the most famous of his crusades in the British Isles. It was there on that crusade that he met another individual by the name of Henry Varley. Some people will know this story. If you don't know the story, you'll know what it's about. Henry Varley is actually the man who made this statement to Moody. Later said he didn't remember making it. Moody never forgot it. Here to the best of our ability to capture what that statement was, because it's kind of been quoted and paraphrased in many different ways. Here it is. Varley said to Moody, the world has yet to see what God can do with and for and through and in a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. As I say later, Varley didn't remember making the statement to Moody, but Moody was so impressed by it, he never forgot it. Well, obviously, when Moody came back, thousands of people were saved during those meetings in the British Isles. So when Moody returned to America... He was not only an evangelist, but he was an internationally known evangelist. A great deal of fame followed him at that point. But you know something, the interesting thing about it is, is Moody took it all exactly as he should have taken it with humility. He made this statement, I know perfectly well that wherever I go and preach, there are many better preachers than I am. All that I can say about it is that the Lord uses me. 
There were seven trips, as I told you, to Great Britain in all, but in another one of them, in the year 1883, he was holding meetings at Cambridge. It was at those meetings in Cambridge that the famous Cambridge Seven that I talked about in the message on Hudson Taylor committed themselves to go to China as, as obviously foreign missionaries and serve under Hudson, Hudson Taylor. In the year 1880, so taking us back just a couple of years, Moody started summer Bible conferences. So lots of people know about these Bible conferences. Moody started summer Bible conferences in Northfield, and out of one of those arose the student volunteer movement. The student volunteer movement was started by 100 college students who pledged when they were finished college to serve God in foreign missions. You begin to see how some of these things that we've looked at are all coalescing and how God is at work in amazing, amazing ways. Moody was always what you might call a discipler. That is to say, he was always realizing the need for Christian workers, always the need for people to be involved in the work. And so, in 1879, he started the Northfield Seminary for Girls, and in 1881, the Mount Hermon School for Boys. And in 1886, listen to the name of the next one. This is about 10 miles long. He, in 1886, he started the Bible Work Institute of the Chicago Evangelization Society. How would you like to tell people that's where he went to school? They'd need half an hour to get the name out. But the important thing about that is the year is 1886. Moody died in 18. That the year is 1886. Moody died in 1899, and shortly before his death, this school, whose name seems so long and so bulky, was renamed Moody Bible Institute. Moody also had a coal portage association. Spurgeon did too. You know, with the Coal Portage Association, what that was, uh, and Moody called them this, people went around to uh, sell to others low-cost Bibles and gospel literature in an effort to take the gospel to people. Moody called them gospel wagons. The, <laughs> the, the wagon, of course, was drawn by the horse. They didn't have the vehicles like we have today. And so Moody called them gospel wagons. Well, what's really interesting about the Coal Portage Association that Moody started is that it was later, or later became, Moody Bible Institute. Not, not Moody Bible Institute, the Moody Press. Moody died in 1899 where he was born, in Northfield, Massachusetts. But not before he left us with another one of his powerful sayings. So listen to this. Moody said this, Someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am right now. I shall have gone up higher. That is, out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal. A body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint. A body fashioned like unto his glorious body. I was born of the flesh in 1837. I was born of the Spirit in 1856. That which is born of the flesh may die. That which is born of the Spirit will live forever. Wow. I'm with him. Are you? Well, we sort of need to think a little bit about what lessons we might draw from the life of Moody. Moody. And it's really frustrating, folks, because, I mean, there are so many different directions that you can go with these types of things. And the only thing I really know, need to, know to do is to try to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and sense the lessons that He wants me to talk about. And the one the thing that just seemed to keep leaping out at me and leaping out at me and leaping out at me is just how much overlap there is, how many common threads, how many elements that seem to dovetail between the story of Moody and Spurgeon. 
Well, lots of things are different, but there are lots of things that are so interestingly and strikingly similar. So I want to talk about two things that are not new but seem very important. It seems maybe as if that as we consider these two men only two weeks apart, because last week we had Fanny Crosby, but the week before was Spurgeon. It seems as if maybe God wants, as we consider these two people only two weeks apart, almost as if God wants to put an exclamation point at the end of some of the things that we talked about before. So two things I want to talk about for a few moments. One of them is, first, I think, again, we have to be very careful that we do not use the exception to disprove the rule. You see, Moody was, like Spurgeon, untrained. It's one of the reasons that I mentioned to you earlier in the message that he really attained nothing more than a fifth-grade education. One writer in his account of D.L. Moody has this to say, and this is all true. It's just this is an interesting way to render. It has a little story embedded in it. But he says, Moody was uneducated. His pronunciation was atrocious. One listener commented that Moody was the only person who could pronounce the name Nebuchadnezzar in two syllables. And his vocabulary was limited. So he never pretended to be a great Bible scholar or theologian. Spurgeon didn't have the opportunity for formal seminary. Moody didn't have the opportunity for formal seminary. He was untrained, really. But interestingly, if you think about this, maybe our temptation is to kind of want to use these people and, and uh, maybe sort of let ourselves off the hook that it's not really necessary to do all of this. It's not really necessary to go to Bible school or to have the training or this or that. God can certainly just use us. And then you start talking about people like Spurgeon and talking about people like Moody. But when you look back and realize that each of these people, see, it's always, it's always the, I won't say the peculiarities, but it's, it's always the off points that we want to pick out than the real point. And so we kind of grab for something like that But when you really look at a true picture of the man's life and how he himself related to that very thing, see, that was something that followed Moody on all through his life. And so Moody started training centers, just like Spurgeon started the pastor's college because he realized how important that training and that preparation really was and realized his own deficit and what he had to do to make up for that in his own life. So I mentioned Moody started the Northfield Seminary for Girls. He started the Mount Hermon School for Boys and then the other school that was eventually or that eventually became Moody Bible Institute. So I think what I just want to reiterate to you again this morning is unless you feel that you are like Spurgeon, exceptional. Unless you feel that you're like Moody, exceptional then probably better not to use them to justify an exception to the rule because more likely than not, the rule is there as a generalization of a truth that is most often in place. God has a prepared place for a prepared person. And it's so important that we realize that the Lord will bless us. It's worth our time. It's worth our trouble. It's worth our sacrifice, to do everything we can to be as prepared as we can for the Lord's service. God will lead us. God will show us exactly what he has for us. Secondly, there is another lesson in what I would like to refer to as the romance of Christian service. This one I think you'll find pretty attractive when you hear about it. Because you see, Moody was led to Christ not by a preacher. So what are you thinking about this today? You're thinking about this message today. You're thinking about, well, he just told me I'm not a Spurgeon. He just told me I'm not a Moody. So there's nothing I can do. Well, wait a minute. Who led Moody to Christ? Edward Kimball. Was Edward Kimball a seminarian? No. Was Edward Kimball a preacher? No. Was Ed, Edward Kimball a teacher in a school? No. 
No, he was a layman. Just like you. Just like somebody out there today who felt the burden of God to serve in his local church and was a Sunday school teacher took serious the responsibility that he had in that Sunday school class that that group of boys who came in that class were a stewardship, were given to him in ministry and felt the importance of being certain that each of them, he, he, this was sort of Kimball's tack. He wanted to be sure that he personally spoke to each of them in an effort to be certain that they knew Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Well, where does this overlap with Spurgeon? Was it a preacher that led Spurgeon to Christ? No. In fact, on that snowy day in 1850, on January 6th, the preacher couldn't make it. You know, as I was thinking a little bit about this sermon, it's interesting the things that come to you. I got to thinking, I wonder what that preacher thought later. I mean, we really don't know very much about that. At the time, the layman that agreed to stand up and say something because he felt like, well, the 12 or 15 people who are here for the service this morning, they've made the trouble and the effort to come out and trudge through all the snow and the snowstorm and be in church on the first Sunday of the year. Surely someone should get up and say something that would give them something for their effort to come. And the man nervously agrees to do it. He had no opportunity to know this was going to happen ahead of time, and he has to stand up. You know, it's like they say, pray, preach, or die. He had to get up there and do something, or an, and a, of the few people that were there agreed to do it. And I got to thinking about, you know, I'm sure the preacher couldn't make it that day. I'm sure he really couldn't. But we don't know the name of this layman who got, got up and gave the message that morning. This is kind of interesting. I was reading another account of it again last night. And one of the things that the writer was talking about was the fact that Spurgeon had such a, again, the exceptional, he had such a memory that later he could almost tell you exactly what the guy said. And <laughs> I was reading through this thing and it just, I mean, it, it cracked me up. It just, you know, it, it just was really interesting to see what the Lord burdened him to say and the way he expressed himself and forgive me, but the lack of grammar and everything else in it that, but the time was right. It was God's day. It was God's day for Charles Spurgeon and this layman. I'm sure now, I'm sure afterwards, this guy figured it out. But you can't help but think about, wonder what the preacher thought. That, wow, maybe I should have made a little extra effort to get to the church that day. But you know, just as I said in, this, in the service on Spurgeon, it did not fall the privilege of his parents or his grandparents. He had a very godly heritage Spurgeon was from a family of preachers, but it did not fall their privilege to lead the 15-year-old boy to Christ. It fell the privilege of a layman in a primitive Methodist church, not even a Baptist church. It didn't fall the privilege of the pastor of the Mount Vernon Congregational Church to to lead D.L. Moody to Christ. And I think one of the things that we have to come to in our lives and in our ministry is to recognize, you know, God is in the business of using anybody who belongs to him as his child, who has a hunger and a thirst and a desire that wants to be used. This is a message for you today. Well, you know what? It's the old thing about throwing the pebble into the pond because you just don't quite know where the rings of influence are going to end What shore distant will they make themselves to? So you might sort of be interested in this. Edward Kimball was the one who led Moody to Christ. In one of Moody's meetings, a man came to Christ by the name of J. Wilbur Chapman. J. Wilbur Chapman was an American Presbyterian evangelist. In one of Chapman's meetings, there sat a man by the name of Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was converted in a Chapman meeting. In one of Billy Sunday's meetings sat an American Independent Baptist 
well, who became an American independent Baptist evangelist. His name was Mordecai Ham. In one of Mordecai Ham's meetings sat a young man by the name of Billy Graham. Now just go think about it. And it all started with a layman, Edward Kimball. Why are you poo-pooing yourself? Why do you keep saying I can't do anything for the Lord? Why do you keep saying God can't use me? Why do you keep saying, well, I don't have any education? Well, if you came by that situation honestly, God isn't going to hold that against you. God will find ways to use you. I can tell you that for sure. And here's something else interesting. I I said I would come back so I don't want to disappoint, though you've probably forgotten that I said that. And tell you something about Ira Sankey. Because Moody, when he heard him in 1870 at that YMCA meeting in Indianapolis, it's as if Moody just recognized that this is the guy I need to make my ministry. I need this man in my ministry. Well, he was a layman. He was a layman just like all these other people. He, he worked for the government. Yeah, he fought, as I said, during the war, and there's some really interesting stories about Ira Sankey and all of that. I don't have time for in the message this morning, but after the war, Sankey took a job with the government. He was fine with that career. That was the way he was headed. He didn't know anything. He was involved with the YMCA, but he didn't know anything about meeting Moody. And all of a sudden, the paths of these two men cross at that particular convention in Indianapolis, And Moody, kind of always an abrupt type person, went to Sankey after the thing was over with this sense from the Lord that Sankey was the person that he needed after he heard him sing. He, can you imagine someone come up and ask you questions like this that you don't really know that well? Where are you from? What is your business? Are you married? Well, (laughs) it took Sankey six months. Now, Moody was a salesman, remember. But it still took Sankey six months to say yes. But when Sankey said yes, an evangelistic team was born. Moody Sankey. How many people were won to Christ by Moody's preaching, but how many people were won to Christ by the soloist who could stand up and sing such numbers as the 90 and 9? or hold the fort for I am coming, or faith is the victory that overcomes the world. You can look in our songbook, and what you'll find is about seven instances of Ira Sankey, but he's not the words, he's the music. The music to some of those ones I told you about a while ago. You just really never know, huh? It's the romance of Christian service, and I want to close the message today by telling you, you know something? If you determine to live that kind of a life as a Christian, you may be in full-time Christian service or you may not. You may just be a full-time Christian. But you have a heart and a belief that if you surrender your life to Christ, God can use you. You may find out the results of some of that and you may not find out the results of some of that. But I will tell you this, whatever you determine to yield and do and give you'll find out something. Jesus always repays. When I thought about that, somehow God brought to mind, through a story I'm going to tell you, the words to a hymn that's very well known. It's one that we use often in a missions context. O Zion, haste. In the last stanza, the writer says, Give of thine own. Now, I think maybe our version might say, give of thy sons. What he's talking about is your sons and daughters when he says, give of thine own. He's not talking so much about money there. But give of thine own to bear the message glorious. Give of thy wealth to speed them on their way. Pour out thy soul for them in prayer victorious. And all thou spendest, Jesus will repay. Wow. Wow. I just wanted to go away from that time humming that song, thinking about that song. Well, here's a little story. Edward Kimball led Moody to Christ. 
Years later, Moody was holding a service in Boston. A young man came up to Moody after the service and introduced himself as the son of Edward Kimball. Moody said, I'm glad to meet you. Are you a Christian? The young man admitted that he wasn't. Moody said, how old are you? He said, 17. Moody said, that was just the age when your father led me to the Lord. And now I want to repay him by leading his son to Christ. So he talked in earnest with the young son of Edward Kimball, 17 years old. And Kimball went away promising that he would surrender his heart to Christ. A short time later, Moody received a letter telling him that the boy had done exactly that. The Sunday school teacher leads Moody to Christ. Moody leads the Sunday school teacher's son to Christ. I'm just telling you, and all thou spendest, Jesus will repay. You will never find a life that is fuller, more rich, than investing all that you have, regardless of where you are in life, regardless of how mean you may think, how little that is, how mediocre you might think your gifts are. You will never invest that without the best return you can find anywhere. Joy and peace, and as we heard about in our Sunday school class this morning, treasures laid up in heaven. Heavenly Father, thank you for your wonderful love. Thank you for the privilege. Oh Lord, when we think about how black our hearts truly are, about what ungrateful wretches we really are, about how even as Christians we fail you all the time, that you love us, Ask us to surrender ourselves to you, whatever it is that we have, that you might use us, and use us you do. Thank you for that. Thank you for that in faith, knowing that much of it we will never see until we get to glory. Thank you for that great hope. Thank you for knowing that the Word of God does not return void. And I pray, Father, you would just give us a new zeal and a holy unction amongst us all and revive us to the thrill and prospect of using whatever it is that we have for Jesus Christ in the hopes that you may use us to see others come to Christ, others who may do exploits far beyond anything we are ever able to accomplish ourselves. However it is you choose to use us, we simply thank you for the privilege and pray that you will multiply as you did the loaves and fishes what simple gifts we give to you. I need this message of being encouraged to reinvest my time, talent, and treasure for Jesus Christ. I need to put away excuses. I need to quit belittling myself. I need to realize that whatever it is that I can give God, He can use. And I want to do that. I want to do that. I want to, I, 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 I want to count. I want to be involved wherever and however God would have me be. Pray for me. That's my heart's yearning in prayer, and it just has sort of slipped in my life. But it's my burden. It's what I want to tell God as this service closes.